I want to race through some of the radio speed lighting. This is where I started with radio speed lighting in, in 2008. 2008. It worked. 2008. Um, Kevin King, a guy working out of his bedroom in Chandler, Arizona, invented the very first radio TTL device, the radio popper. And I called Kevin up and I said, hey, would you loan me a mess of the radio poppers? I want to see what will happen. He frankly said, I'd love to, I, but I have no idea if they're all going to work. And then it, this took an act of Congress. I got Canon Pro Services, CPS, to send me an arsenal of speed lights, because I owned it at the time, too. And I went to Home Depot, and I got a piece of oak, and I put this rail together, and my sons and I just goofed around for a day. Lo and behold, I had no idea that the hero shot of the day would eventually become, a year and a half later, the cover select for Speedlighter's handbook. But this is where I started with radio speed lighting way back in the day. Now, in terms of where we go forward, this is a shot made with the softbox that is off camera, but it's over there on the side, the Apollo softbox. And one of the things that I love about the Apollos is you put the speed light inside of it, and you can use one speed light and create beautiful light. You can use three speed lights, because there's space, or four, depending on the bracket and use them at lower power and get a super fast recycle time. But in either case, the Apollo is a great modifier, a great softbox for speed lighters. But to make it work, you've got to put the speed light on the inside and zip it up, which means you've got to have a way to control it, which is where I became so addicted to those extra long ETTL cords until I got the 600. On the extra long ETTL cord, I control it from the back of my camera by running the cord up in the inside of the box. Now, I don't even have to use the cord. And I control the entire system. So with the cord, that's the slave. Those are the masters. In a radio environment, they're all slaves. And I can create beautiful light. And I can jump back and forth between ETTL and manual. This is one softbox and one speed light. The background is being lit because I push the softbox so that one third of it is on the model, and two thirds of it are behind her blowing the light onto that old wood door. So this is a one light photograph. Here's a shoot that I did this summer in a wood shop in Kentucky. And just to give you a quick crash course, my workflow for portraits always begins with a study of the ambient light. I want to know what my camera sees in the case of the ambient light. Before I turn on my speed lights, I want to know what the camera sees in case of the ambient light. I'm typically dimming the ambient light in my shots. So this wood shop was so crowded and I'm trying to maintain the rapport with the craftsman that I'm photographing. So I've got a 600 on the back of the impact quick box over there, and I've got a slave right here firing into that piece of foam core that's more easily seen in this shot. So uh, one speed light through a $125 quick box, another bare 600 firing into a $3 piece of white cardboard, creating all of this important fill light over there. We did this shoot in about 15 minutes. His shop was so crowded with projects and wood and tools that if I'd had to run around and manually make the changes on my speed lights, it'd have been a nightmare. I would not have maintained the rapport that I had with him to get that all essential smile. Yeah, he's a big tatted guy, but he's basically Santa Claus. Santa Claus goes to Western Kentucky and makes furniture through the summer. Is any gels on those lights? Uh, no, no gels on those lights. Here's a portrait session I did on a very tiny balcony above San Francisco. This is the KC Beauty Reflector. And I've had the Beauty Reflector for a number of years, but I've never been able to successfully use it with optical slaves because our optical sensors are smashed right up against the back of the Beauty Reflector. And what that Beauty Reflector does is fire the two speed lights into an, an opaque disc. The light flies sideways and backwards and spreads out and comes forward. I was able to control everything from the back of my camera on to jump backwards really quick on that balcony, which was about 28 inches deep. And I'm crammed over against this wall right over here on the outside. And there's no way in an optical system, even if I turn those slave bodies to the side, there's no way that my master would have jumped around that beauty dish. Again, able to control the whole system from the back of my camera changing from ETTL to manual to explore which shooting mode, changing the power, all right? 
Clamshell lighting is basically a technique that you, enables you to create almost shadowless light. So clamshell lighting, you take two soft boxes, you put them vertically above your subject, and you position that camera so it shoots through the hinge of the clam. And you set your key light, the top light, light your subject, and then you turn on the bottom light, and you turn the power up or down to control the shadows under the chin and so on to suit your vision. This was easily, easily done with radio. Those are the Apollo soft boxes that I'm so fond of. And their top box is certainly out of reach anyway. All right? So I don't have to worry about line of sight. I don't have to worry about master to slave. I just basically throw in the 600s. I've got the transmitter on the top of my camera. I've got Anna in front of the lens. I'm working out my lighting ratios. And I'm talking to Anna, and we're getting the shoot done. Here's Anna again. This is these two shoots, by the way. Actually, these last three shoots are all in lighting for digital photography. This is a classic three light headshot. All right, corporate type lighting. All right, I've got a key light, a fill light, and a hair light. The only way in the past I was able to see what each of those lights was doing individually was literally to run around and shut them off with group mode. I say, okay, I'm going to turn off the fill light and the hair light and just shoot key light. Now I'm going to turn on the fill light and shut off the key light. Now I'm going to shut off that and turn on the hair light so that I can see what they're doing. This is the, this is the set, by the way. So again, you, you see a pattern here. I'm going to these Apollo soft boxes. I'm putting my Canon speed lights on the inside. I'm controlling everything from the back of my camera. And the transmitter in the hot shoe is communicating to the slaves. How many lights do you have in this one? One. One speed light. That's one of the things I really love about the Apollo. It's incredibly efficient because of that silver foil interior. But the downside to it is you have to have a way to control that speed light. Because having to rip open the diffuser and get in there and make a power adjustment, not so much fun. Okay? On a cord, I was always able to I've always been able to turn the speed light inside an Apollo into the master and have it send the optical instructions to like a rim light or a hair light outside that wasn't in another softbox. So really quick, this is a portrait I did of a young soccer player who happens to be my youngest son. And um, Tony's so patient uh, most often when I'm asking him to model for me. And I caught him after soccer practice one day. And basically the way I executed this, which is a typical athlete kind of shot, is I've got two speed lights in the back that are creating that hatchet light coming across his cheek. So basically, this light right in here, right there, is the speed light. That's the fiery orb, namely the sun. I put the sun behind Tony. And then I have a speed light in the hot shoe of my camera to fill in those shadows. Now, one of the important things to understand, when you throw a light behind your subject to create this cool sculpting light that comes off the cheeks with athletes, they definitely want to see that kind of hatchet lighting you've got to be really careful that those lights don't flare into the lens. So I use that rogue flash bender that I showed you earlier. But the problem with doing this optically is that that flash bender is so big, which is why I love to use it as a flag, that it blocks that slave sensor. So optically, it's a challenge. No worries with radio. I throw my flags up, I get the lights positioned, and the radio, of course, does all the communicating. <coughs> So the fact that that optical signal, which is shown in the green dash, would have been blocked. I get this shoot. I'm talking to Tony. And we get the work done in five minutes, and we're out of there. Okay. Now this is an old trick in terms of creating window light or sunset using CTO gels. And in the old days, what we'd have to do is we'd run a master speed light over to the window on some sort of cord. And then we would have that master in the lower corner, which you see right there, send the instructions out to the speed lights outside. And the key to getting this believable light, when I actually did this shoot for real, it was during a rainstorm. And the key to getting this believable light to look like a setting sun is twofold. One, to make it the right color. So those color temperature orange gels, the CTO gel, does that. Number two, you've got to get your lights away from the window. Sunlight is very, very directional. So if you use a big soft box, you can, nobody's going to say, oh, that's a setting sun. It doesn't work. So you've got to put those speed lights outside the room. Radio, again, gives me the opportunity. I don't have to worry about putting the master at the window and sending a cord to the camera. It's like, oh, just put the speed lights outside and talk to them from the back of the camera. All right? This is a shoot I did up in Maine Media, my Canon Speedlights Demystified workshop. 
that I teach up there every summer. And so at the end of the week, we go out to the lake, and this portrait was done basically by putting the model up on the rock, and notice how bright it was. And we dimmed the ambient light six stops. Anytime you point your camera to the western sky, even though the sun has gone below the horizon, there is still a ton of light. So you know this already. You go to the beach, the sun sets, you want to take a picture of your friend. You either get your friend in the photo and the sky's blown out, or you get the sky beautifully colored and they're a silhouette until you add the light back onto them. So in this case, we had this crazy contraption where I had, all right, and it was a workshop demo. So I said, here's the potential. This was pre-radio, but you see the quick step. There's the master on the cord and everybody else is a slave. Now why would you ever want to use so many speed lights in a seven foot silver umbrella? It's so that you can create shots like this. I wanted a huge field of soft light. This is the same rock 30 minutes later. Different model, of course, okay? I wanted to fire in high-speed sync so I could get those water drops to freeze in the air. High-speed sync takes a two and a half stop power hit. At a workshop, it's really convenient because I got all these students who have gear. <laughs> and Canon sent gear in too for that workshop. So I had Buku speed lights. So in the case of radio, it makes it just a little bit more easy in terms of controlling that whole system. And actually, if we want to say, oh, let's use one light, let's use three lights, whatever. But generally, with those big seven-foot parabolic umbrellas that Westcott and others are selling now, I like the Westcott one a lot, um, you need at least three speed lights in there because it's just so big that you can't fill up that parabolic umbrella with one speed light. So you put three in there, and then you can begin doing some really cool shots. So I've reached the end of my prepared comments. Again, that is a reminder of the two spots on the web. You'll find me if you put SIL at in front of either one of those domains. That's my email address. And I'm happy to answer any questions that we've got before we head home tonight. <coughs> two really disparate ones. Let's go back to the previous shot, please. I noticed there's ghosting on his left hand, which suggests movement, ambient light. You mentioned you used high-speed sync, or maybe not high-speed enough. Yeah, this guy was flying, and you're right. So consider on a, a 5D2 that high-speed sync can be a 250th of a second, because the sync speed is a 200th of a second. I think we shot this at 400th or something. But as he was flying, his hand was literally moving. So you're right, even though, I mean, speed is always relative to, shutter speed is always relative. So, next the question. question um, group mode is just a beautiful thing, a totally beautiful thing. Group mode thing. is a beautiful thing. It could be perfect with some subtle changes. I'm sure it's been to you where you've got three or four different groups and adjusting them from the back of the camera. You've got to go through so many clicks and button clicks to change levels. I've worked through you the camera, <laughs> a persistent, context-sensitive group menu on the back where you're just changing output levels for each light. Yep. Group mode has many beautiful features, absolutely. Does it seem a bit of a challenge that you have to, basically, anytime you hit the shutter button, you get ejected back to the top of the menu system? Yeah, you know, absolutely. If you do that a couple of hundred times, you know where those things are. So. It's like learning a foreign language. You've got to do it a couple hundred times, and then you eventually get it. Do I wish that I was some sort of oracle for the Canon speed lighting design team? Absolutely. Do I think that I am? No. <laughs> but, but that said, I totally agree with you. I would love a menu system that doesn't change. When I go back, it's right where I left it. It's right where I left it. That quick view is a good start. That quick view menu that we have on the 2012 cameras is a good start but I'd love for it to not eject me back up to flash control. Consistent yep, exactly. All right, other questions? Back on the picture, in, uh, the name of the woman you showed inside of the extract kit, inside of the column, um, all of them had to be 600? In this case, these are all 580s. So this was shot two years ago, pre-radio. Mm -hmm. So I throw this shoot up here, though, as an example I'm just saying here are the kinds of things we can do. We can create synergies through many small lights. And I had, you know, it's not uncommon for each of us to have one or two or three speed lights. So you get a couple of Canonistas together, three, four Canonistas together. It's like, all right, everybody get their gear out. Back in the day when I was working in optical and you're working with pocket wizards and you're, you know, whatever, it didn't really work. And so the idea was to demonstrate 
take a bunch of speed lights, get them to work together to do something bigger than any of them can do individually, namely create a huge field of soft light in high speed sync. In the case of radio, what we're doing is we're basically taking all these units that aren't slaves, mainly the master, and it becomes a slave, and then I've got the transmitter, but we have to magically say those are all 600s rather than 580s. But if you have this cord, it wouldn't matter whether they're cutting No, that's, that's how we ran this system. So with an ETTL cord running down to the camera, that becomes the master, and these are all the slaves, and all you change the whole system up from the back of your camera. So radio or optical, this lighting setup still works beautifully. So why, why don't Canon just uh, manufacture some cheaper altitude radio fashion? So the question is, why doesn't Canon um, manufacture a less expensive radio-enabled speed light? Again, I'm no oracle, and I read the same rumor blogs that everybody else reads. Um, I'm going to say chances are pretty high that in 2013, we're going to see the sun continue to come up and we'll eventually see Canon come out with a radio-enabled 400 series speed light. It's, I think that's going to happen. Okay? I, do I know? No, but I think it's going to happen. It's only a logical business idea. Okay? Um, so I think they will, and then party's on, because I love the 430EX. You, know, you can buy two of those for the cost of 1580 in the old days, and they're only two-thirds of a stop dimmer, so you're actually getting more light per dollar anyway. So that will eventually, I think, happen. Any other questions? Yeah? Did you say you're updating the speed lighters? So I did not say I was updating speed lighters handbook. What I said is I'm working on a successor. What does that mean? It means that I'm not going to redo speed lighters handbook um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I don't want to take another year of my life to do a single project like that one. I did that. It's like, I don't want to do that again. I'll go find something equally stupid and monumental to pursue. Um, but more importantly, more sincerely, um, Speedlight's handbook is full of words, and photographers are visual creatures. Um, and so for the last year, and more importantly, for the last three months, I've been working really, really hard on finding ways to th communicate things visually. So the successor to Speedlight's handbook will have a completely new format that is not word dense. It's not word dense. Do I know when that's going to come out? I haven't a clue. Although the prototype will be, I hope, by the end of January, um, I'm going to self-publish an e-book on the 600EX system. Much of what you've seen tonight is going to be in that e-book, OK, but to, uh, as a way to prototype. Because we're, we're digesting information differently than we were. We're looking at pictures more and reading less. So um, yeah, there is definitely more information coming out. But I don't, and I don't, and I've also streamlined my kit. So thank you for everyone who's bought Speedlighter's handbook. I think it's you know, still worth, worth your time and worth your $28.42. Um, thank you for that. There's three arena boys who are benefiting. But going forward, um, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to redo that. I'm going to find new things to say and a more visual way to say them. OK. See what happens with words? It took 20 minutes to answer your simple question. That's why if I had pictures, I'd say, no, this is what I'm doing. We're done. Yeah. OK, great question. Thank you for calling me out on it. And I'm going to rephrase what you said. So he said, in groups, can you change the zoom? The real question is, can you zoom a slave via the master? And the answer to that is no. You can, and I, I, I neglected to bring that up earlier. So great question. Thank you for that. You always have to go over to a slave and manually push the zoom button. There is no way to remotely zoom that speed light. Not a big deal for me, because i got to figure out where I'm going to put it in the first place. And when I'm setting up that light stand and maybe the modifier, I'm thinking, oh, i got to fill up a big umbrella or a big softbox. I'll be wide. Or I want just that slash of light. So maybe I need a gel. So I'm making all those decisions on my slave. Having to zoom it is not anything much more than one of those simple decisions. Is there any other flash functionality that you can't control from the transmitter? Is there any other flash functionality that you can't control from the transmitter? So transmitter, um, just review, it only works with 600s right now because it only speaks radio. So you cannot use the transmitter with older speed lights. You can use the 600 speed light as an optical master or as an optical slave. But the transmitter is radio only. Um, in terms of other slave functions that it doesn't control, no. And that, by the way, the fact that a master does not zoom a slave is not new. 
It's never, we've never had that functionality.